reading through the Bible in one year. Uh, this is January 2nd, going through Genesis 2, Ezra 2, 1 through 35, Matthew 2, and Acts 2, 1 through 41. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested from on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, which means separate, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the from the land was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust and from the ground and breathed into it, uh, into his nostrils, a breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden, in, a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the, I can't words. Okay. There he put the man <laughs> he had formed and out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. The, uh, it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hav- the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Uh, Bedellum and Onyx are there, or Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, uh, the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, or called every living creature, that was its name. Uh, The man gave names to all livestock and to all birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, took one of his ribs and closed, it, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Going now to Ezra 2, 1 through 35. Now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, uh, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Mordecai, that, we'll get to that later. Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Bena. The number of the men of sorry, the number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perosh, two thousand one hundred and seventy-two. The sons of Shephatiah, um, three hundred and seventy-two. The sons of Aras, seven hundred seventy-five. The sons of Pehath, Moab, Moab, uh, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab. 2,812, sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 945, the sons of Zaki, 760, the son of Bani, uh, 642, the sons of Bebai, 623, the sons of Esgad, 1,222, the sons of um, Adonikam, 666, <gasps> the sons of Bigvi, 2,056, the sons of Adin, 454, the sons of Ater, namely of Hezekiah, 98, 
The sons of Bezai, 200, sorry, 323. Sons of Jorah, 112. The sons of Hashem, 223. The sons of Gibar, 95. The sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of uh, Netapha, 56. The, the men of Anathoth, 128. The sons of Asmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Arim, Kephira, and Beeroth, 743. The sons of Rama, uh, sorry, Rama and Geba, 621. The men of Michmas, Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. Sons of Nebo, 52. The son of the sons of Magbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, two. 1254. Sons of Harim. Um, 320, the sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, uh, 725, the sons of Jericho, 345, the sons of Sena, um, 3,630. Picking up now the story of Jesus. Well, the whole Bible is the story of Jesus, but now we're picking up again in the Gospels in Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes uh, of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them uh, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going out of the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and there I will... Sorry, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the, uh, took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, brief aside here. Uh, people, especially around the Christmas time, will tell you, oh, Jesus was a refugee. And you know he would have been turned away at, the, at our borders. No, 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 that's not the case at all. So... Rome ruled everywhere at this time. They ruled the land of Israel. They ruled the land of, um, well, everywhere that um, uh, that Paul went on his journeys. It was all covered by Rome. And he also ruled Egypt. Or Rome did, at least. So it wouldn't be like us trying to escape to Canada or to Mexico from the U.S., um, a better way to look at it is they're living in, say, Colorado, and they want to um, they want to go and hide in, say, I don't know, Texas or Wyoming, somewhere like that. There wasn't really a border between them. They they had borders, but that was all enforced by the Roman government. Um, that wasn't enforced by um, the people who live there because it was basically just seen as a state. That's kind of how it was. Anyway, continuing on. So then Herod, when he saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem uh, and in that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then it was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Now, the reason why it's two years old is because um, it took time for the men from the east to come. 
And by the time that they got there uh, from the, from the wise, we don't know that it was three. We just know that there were three gifts that were given. So we call it three wise men, but it's really not really the three wise men. There could have been more, um, could have been less really. We just know that it was more than one wise person. So, um, we know that it was basically two years or like a year and a half in that range. Uh, so all the pictures you see of, um, you know, the, the, the three wise men coming and showing up when Jesus is a little baby didn't happen. It happened much later than that. The shepherds saw him when he was born, um, but certainly not the wise men. All right, continuing on. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. And for those who sought the, sorry, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus uh, was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. All right, now we're going to finish in Acts 2, 1 through 41. Okay, now the, the, the note here, just briefly, Pentecost is 50 days after um, the uh, Passover. Uh, Penta is five. It's, I don't know, that's a whole number of things. Anyway, that's all that means. Um, also, this is something that was uh, celebrated by those in the early church. I don't really know why um, Protestant churches don't celebrate this instead of other things like Christmas, but... Um, it's just my view. It's something bad. It doesn't hurt anything, but just kind of throwing that out. Anyway, so when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in uh, others' tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the term tongues here, it doesn't mean that they're speaking in the, in the language of, you know, angels and men and all that. Uh, all it means is that um, they were speaking in other regional dialects that were known at that time. That's really all that that means. So, um, let me see. Okay. So now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of the, sorry, at this, the sound of the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each so how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and uh, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. Egypt and the parts of Lebanon belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, uh, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. See, so it's actually normal languages that we would hear or that they have heard in the area regional dialects, that kind of thing. They're not speaking in a secret language, you know, or they don't have some sort of weird utterance. That's all that tongues means. Anyway, continuing on. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Third hour. The way that the hours work is you start off at six o'clock in the morning and then you move around from there. So that the days are basically from six to six. Uh, that's a good way to, to kind of get an idea of that. So basically what he's saying is it's nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk yet. Give them time. Might happen later. They might have some alcohol, but that's okay. Um, just know that right now they're not drunk. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and my female servants. And in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. For before, sorry, before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That lawless men doesn't mean that they're, you know, um, some sort of like rootin' tootin', you know, uh, black hat cowboys, right? These are just people who exist outside of the law. He's basically saying you, you delivered him over to be crucified by Gentiles, right? Anyway, continuing on. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that it may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh will, sorry, also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, which is the realm of the dead, um, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you now with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb was with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him um, that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore um, exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out um, this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, as a quick aside, I am a Reformed Baptist. So our particular Baptist is, I guess, a better way to say it. And... This line right here is one of those that people who believe in um, pedo baptism, that we should baptize infants, and that by um, our baptizing of infants, we are not um, making them Christians. We're not forcing the hand of God to save people because of this. Um, now, some people believe that. But um, most, like Presbyterians, they don't believe that. They, they believe that they're just, you know, including them in the covenant family of God and creating covenant children, um, you know, by following God's commandments to, to baptize all infants, which doesn't really exist in Scripture. But we're not going to go to that. But this is one of those lines. You know, this promise is for you and for your, all your children who are far off. Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of um, Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the line that is then shown below it for the promises for you and for your children, for all who are far off. Um, it, what it means instead of children here, and I'm going to get people who are going to complain on this, but it's not your physical children the same way that the people of Israel, true Israel, as we'll read when we get to Romans, um, isn't the genetic descendants of Israel right? True Israel, just like the true descendants of Christians here, are those who follow in the faith of Christ, right? Now, there is certainly benefit that comes to children from um, uh, being born into a Christian family or being raised up in a Christian family. Um, uh, they, they certainly get a completely different worldview than they would have from anyone else. Um, 
But the point of the matter is that um, where it says the promise is for you and for your children, it's talking about your descendants. I mean, the promise is certainly there that um, if you repent and you know entrust in Christ for the work that he has done in your place, then certainly, certainly this promise is for you that God will forgive your sins um, and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for everyone everywhere who repents and believes. But it's not, you can't force God's hand to save your children by baptizing them. It doesn't work. And I know many, many people who were raised in the church and who were baptized as infants and even baptized later, um, who later walked away from their faith. And as we learned from Paul, those who walk away, the, the only reason why they can walk away is because they don't have a part of the family to begin with. Because how can you, as someone who knows Christ, who knows God, who knows that he exists, later turn and say, eh, I don't think he really exists. It doesn't work. You must never have known him to begin with. Because if you had known the king of all creation, if you had known the creator of the universe in a personal way, if you knew that what he said is true, if you would see his impact, not only in your life, but in the lives of other people, how can you later on go, I was just mistaken. I was totally wrong. He doesn't exist. You can't. Anyway, all that said, um, so there we go. Day number two doot, in the books. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.